So if y'all will remember, uh, we just had hospitality taught to us uh, from Third John, and we saw its example allegorized by Bunyan with this man named Gaius taken after Third John. And now that they've passed out of Gaius's house, they're going to Vanity Fair, and some changes have taken place. Mercy and Ma- Matthew and Mercy are married. And Gaius gave his daughter Phoebe to James, Matthew's brother. So there's some of the sons of Christian are married now. And as they're going, they're, they're very merry. Um, and there's a conversation that begins here in the chapter where Greatheart asks for a bill. Like, what are you going to charge us, Gaius? And Gaius doesn't charge him. Why doesn't he charge him? Anybody know? He says, Gaius told him that it was not the custom for pilgrims to pay for their entertainment at his house. He lodged them on a yearly basis, but he looked for his payment to come from the capital G, capital S, Good Samaritan. Who is that? That was question one. It's Jesus Christ. That's right. So, if you want to look at that text briefly, Luke chapter 10. Starts in verse 25, but if you will remember, a lawyer had came up and tested Jesus. And Jesus reads to him the law, in a sense. And the man said, you, you answered rightly, Jesus. Love God, love your neighbor. He, and then, but now that being clarified and established, the lawyer then goes on to say, uh, who is my neighbor? Love, you know, that part on love God, love your neighbor. And it specifically says, the Holy Spirit tells us that he, the reason why he asked that question is he wanted to justify himself. So, what does that mean when somebody wants to justify themselves? What do you think, Chris? Well, he's thinking that he's already done everything that he needs to do. He's thinking that he's already done everything that he needs to do in order to be right with God, and he's demonstrating that by, by not necessarily mockingly asking the question, but at the same time, he's um, not taking it as seriously as he should. He's saying, like, who is my neighbor? Like, like, he thinks he's already loved his neighbor to that. Yeah. Like, if, if this were your neighbor, everybody recognizes your neighbor, there's a, another group out here that's not your neighbor. So he's saying, who's that, Lord? Because he wants to justify himself in the way he treats all these people he categorizes as not his neighbor. So Jesus doesn't just say everybody's your neighbor. But that's the parable of the Good Samaritan, the whole point of it. So don't miss the points like that when the context of the Bible's there and you see why Jesus is giving a parable. What's going on in the mind of our Lord when He's speaking this? He's speaking it to rebuke someone. And in the parable, He gives two examples of a priest and a Levite. And neither one of them help Him. But it's a Samaritan. And for this lawyer... Samaritans were in this category. So the lawyer is treating, wrongly treating Samaritans, and then Jesus is saying the Samaritan has it right, and he's got everybody as his neighbor. So the very person that you abuse or sin against is the one that's righteous, and you're not. That's a way of saying that indirectly. So uh, he teaches, and it, and, it, and it gets you to think, because it's a parable. You know, it gets you to think, like, wait a minute, that is right that that Samaritan did that to uh, this man. That's the right way to treat somebody. That's love, and that was his, he was being a neighbor. He was treating him as his neighbor. 
and um, you know, it was intended to expose that hypocrisy. Well, Jesus is the good Samaritan. He is the one that heals and uh, is exemplified by this good Samaritan. Uh, he's the one that came from heaven and uh, came to his enemies, came into the filth of this world. If you uh, think about sin as, as corruption and filthy, and he came to those lying in a ditch dead, gave them life, and uh, forever has he taken and added to himself humanity that he might be a sufficient mediator with, etern- in it, with an eternal life. Um, so Gaius is thinking, guys, I don't need payment because the one that gave the Good Samaritan parable is the Good Samaritan and he will repay. All right. Uh, from there, though, they go and they get bid farewell. Uh, feeble mind doesn't want to go with them. He says, guys, I'm going to be a burden on you. I can't go with you. Um, and he gives all these reasons. He's got a lot of logical reasons why he can't go with them. And what does great heart do in essence? Y'all remember? Nobody? Brother Tom. Thank you, brother. He has a commission to comfort the feeble-minded and support the weak. Yes. Uh, that's right. Uh, from First Thessalonians 5. So, Great Heart says, now specifically, for you, feeble mind, we'll wait for you. So you're slower, we're going to wait for you. That's interesting because Bunyan talked about a guy that wanted him to wait and in chapter part one and Christian kept going on. He's like, no, I can't delay. But, but what Bunyan's uh, illustrating here is that uh, within the faith, there is Christian love and it's serving those who are weaker than you. Serving those in need, both physically and spiritually. It's not um, being unfaithful so the person that wanted Christian to slow down before was it was related to sin, not related to love. Uh, so some people might want you to slow down and kind of live a a, um, a less useful, fruitful Christian life, and that's what that lesson was. This lesson isn't teaching you to sin or take it easy in the Christian life by helping people like people mind. It's telling you to love them. Um, so we'll wait for you we'll lend you our help and for your sake we'll deny ourselves some of the things both biased and practical and we won't ju- ju- pass judgment on disputable matters so he's, he says I won't like laughing I won't like showy clothing I won't like unprofitable questions I'm so weak a man that I'm likely to be offended by that which others have the freedom to do. I don't know all the truth. I'm a very ignorant Christian man. Sometimes if I hear some people rejoice in the Lord, it troubles me because I can't do the same thing. With me, it's like it is with a weak man among the strong. So, great hearts encouraging him by not saying, not, by saying he must do it, you know, like it's our commission. But then he gives them examples. Uh, and we see that in, like, if you look at 1 Corinthians 9. Um, Paul says in verse 19, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews to those who were under the law as under the law. So I know 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 11, 1 deal primarily with the 
use of Christian liberty with reference to the world, unbelievers, but it's not exclusively that because in chapter 8, he does talk about um, for some with consciousness of the idol until now, eat it as a thing offered to an idol, but their conscience being weak is defiled. And then he he says, beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Um, and because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish. So he does talk about Christian liberty in this section with reference to your brother as well, but the emphasis of it is on our relationship to the world. Just giving you context. If you want the use of Christian liberty with reference to the body of Christ, a really primary text on that is Romans 14 through 15, 7 or 4, I can't remember which. Um, so, Paul's saying, this is how you ought to be, because later in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he's going to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And then what does he say? I am free, but I've made myself a servant. So, great heart saying, Brother, we're going to make ourselves a servant to you. And in Romans 14, there's an answer as to why. What's, most, what's more important than whether or not we're hanging out with somebody and fellowshipping with somebody that can't laugh when we laugh? What's more important than when we got somebody that's got a weak conscience with something that we're doing versus somebody who doesn't? What's more important than those things? It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So that is far more. If you value righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit with God's people, you will find it much easier by faith to serve others who are like feeble-minded. But if you want to dispute and don't have patience with people and so forth, uh, it's likely because there's some other motive at work. Uh, going on from there, who comes along Mr. Feeblemind to help him and goes along with the group? Do you remember, Sophia? Or did you read it? Uh, it it uh, it was Mr. About to Fall. Okay, Ready to Fall is, is probably uh, the original. In our contemporary eyes books, it's about to fall. But the point is, is this person is weak, like Mr. Feeblemind, and he's about to fall. But he comes and he's got crutches, and he's like, "Hey, you can take a crutch." So it was actually an encouragement to Mr. Feeblemind. And it's good that these people are with the others of the body of Christ because as a group, um, that will become a means of their perseverance. All right, then they go on. I'm kind of doing all these together. Uh, even the question, because question one was, where did Gaius look for his pay? We answered that from heaven, the good Samaritan. When will those who have served faithfully like Gaius receive their reward? That's in, in eternity, after, at the judgment and the benefits um, conferred in the resurrection and beyond. Uh, what were the pilgrims in great need of for some time? Where should pilgrims seek refuge and good company? So that gets into Vanity Fair. So when they get to Vanity Fair, they begin to talk about it and they remember faithful, they remember Christian. What happened to faithful at Vanity Fair? He was martyred, right? So they talk about that some and now they, they turn to Mr. Greatheart and they ask him, you know, how are we going to get through Vanity Fair because of this history we're aware of? And Mr. Greatheart says, having led several pilgrims through Vanity Fair before, he said there is uh, someone who lives in Vanity Fair that we can house with or lodge with. 
and his I don't know how to pronounce it maybe y'all can help me because it's M-N-A-S-O-N and I'm not used to seeing a name like that it's either Mason or Nason is it with an M? Nason? okay the M is silent Nason so uh, they stay at Mr. Nason's house and what do they learn about Vanity Fair from Mr. Nason and the people that he's lodging like there's also Mr. Contrite there, Mr. Holy Man, Mr. Love Saint, Mr. Dare Not Lie, and Mr. Penitent. What do they learn from them after they sit down with them at the table and begin to fellowship? And um, what do they learn about Vanity Fair? Anything changed about Vanity Fair? No? All right. Yeah. They're not martyring Christians as they did. Amen. Brother Tom said they've cooled down and they're not martyring people anymore. Um, At the same rate. At the same rate, yeah. On page 375, Mr. Contrite asked, uh, Mr. Honest asked Mr. Contrite and the rest what the condition their town was presently in. And they, he said, we, you can rest assured we're always in a hurry while we're there. It's hard keeping our hearts and spirits in any good order when we're in a challenged condition. You know, there's a lot we have to put up with. Uh, but how, and then Anna says, but how are your neighbors now as for the peacefulness of the city or the town, the fair? He says they're much more moderate now than before. So, He says, you know how Christian and faithful were abused in our town, but lately I say they've been far more moderate. I think the blood of faithful weighs heavily upon them to this day. For since they burned him, they've been ashamed to burn anyone else. In those days, we were afraid to walk the streets, but now we can show our heads. Then the name of a professor of faith was detestable, but now, especially in some parts of our town, for you know our town is large, religion is accounted honorable. I think that's the main lesson of the chapter. Because it's focused on Vanity Fair, and even at the end of the chapter, it says, uh, if you go to page 380 just to show you this theme, um, second paragraph when they had gone from the townspeople and they were getting ready to leave the town and their friends had told them goodbye they quickly came to the place where faithful was put to death they stood still there and thanked God who had enabled him to bear his cross so well and rather because they had found they received a benefit by such a manly suffering as his They went on, therefore, talking about Christian and faithful and how hopeful joined himself to Christian after faithful was dead. And Bunyan reminds us, too, that... um, Where was it? On page 372, Greatheart said, And just as brave things came from it, as the story relates it, hopeful and some others were converted by his death. So hopeful was converted by faithful's death. So what, what I believe that the theme and focus of our chapter tonight and what we want to attempt to draw our attention to biblically is um, suffering and uh, both glory to come and benefits God gives to His people through suffering even in this life. Um, So, in the Bible, where can you think of a person who suffered and it was used by God to bring forth uh, good in this life? Any text? Are you saying something, Eric? Rafi, what you got? 
That's Eric. You got this. Thing. You got this, man. <laughs> All right. Uh, Rebecca. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's look at that briefly. I, I'm also thinking of... Uh, I'm also thinking of Stephen. But, uh, and we can look at these texts together. Um, If you just turn to Genesis 50, though. I want to read where he talks about Verse 19, Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am in the place, am am I in the place of God? Uh, Which the answer is no. So his brothers were saying, we are your servants. You know, they recognize who he is. He is of the highest possible rank under Pharaoh in Egypt. God has elevated him. They thought that they had... Uh, sold him into slavery and that his life perhaps had been ended and he was no longer alive. And that's what they told his father. And now he's revealed himself and they are afraid because they know with a guilty conscience they sinned. And he says, do not be afraid. For am I in the place of God? This is not your judgment day. He says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Therefore, now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. What were some of the things that Joseph suffered? Does anybody remember? This is a long section here at the end of Genesis. But remind, remind, let's remind ourselves of some of the things that he suffered. Brenda. He was thrown into a pit by his brothers, sold into slavery, falsely okay. accused. Yes. So uh, we'll start off with the pit. Uh, why was he thrown into the pit? Yeah, his uh, Rebecca said because of his dreams and his brothers were jealous. So if you remember, Joseph was given a dream by the Lord, which was served as a vision form prophecy of, in the immediate context, his one day rule. And we see it there in Genesis 50. They're bowing down to him in the dream. We see the wheat bowing down. But they also were already jealous because their father favored him and had given him a tunic of many colors. So out of envy, and with envy is a murderous spirit, they thought to themselves, let's kill him now that we're in the wilderness. So they threw him in a pit. But uh, one of the brothers said, this is not right. We we can't murder our brother. So they pulled him out and then they sold him into slavery. Then he's in slavery and he does excellent by the grace of God and is in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife attempts to tempt him to sin and he doesn't uh, fall with the temptation but withstands it by God's grace and gratitude in his heart. And then she lies about him, saying he came on to her. And then Potiphar, not knowing the truth, had him put into prison. So he's like in a dungeon. And there come Pharaoh's, who is it? His his baker and his cupbearer. And... There, 
God gives him grace to interpret a dream. And they end up getting pulled out of prison and have served their time and now they're serving before the king and then something comes up where there's a a dream to interpret and one of them remembers there's this man that's excellent and he was able to interpret a dream. So then they call him forth, he interprets it, and then the king recognizes or Pharaoh recognizes the, uh, the blessing that he is and elevates him to a high rank, second rank in Egypt. So you see, Joseph starts up here in the bosom of his father and comes down through the instrumentality of the murderous intent of his own brothers. And then he goes into judgment. He's falsely accused. He's in the lowest of lows. And then who is it that brings him out? God through giving him divine revelation. And now he comes out, and what does God do? Erect him into the highest rank and the biggest power in the world to then be a blessing during a famine. Does that remind you of anything? There's biblical theology there to see. That's... uh, I, I don't. I know that the New, Te- the New Testament does not explicitly identify Joseph as a type of Christ, but that is one knowing typology, and considering all those things that we've established biblically about identifying types. It fo- it fits all the criteria that we've seen biblically. Um, so, anyways. Um, With the Lord, we see Him suffering. And He's always whom we should look to see what God does through suffering. Um, In this Vanity Fair, what's going to happen? Since Christ has suffered, and now He's been elevated to the right hand of God, what's being made, what are His enemies being made right now? His footstool. So, at a point we await, this earth will be blessed and be cleansed by Christ who suffered. Um, let's look now at Stephen. Go to Acts. So, in chapter 7, Stephen addresses the high priest and the Sanhedrin. And he's being there, taken into account, and he's giving testimony. And he said, Brethren, fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. So he's going to now talk about deliverers that God has sent. And if you look uh, on page, or uh, on verse 9, and the patriarchs becoming envious sold Joseph into Egypt But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles. And God gave him and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh and king king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. So we see that God made Joseph a deliverer in Israel. Then we go to Moses. Uh, Moses was treated treacherously and oppressed our... uh, he was, uh, let me read it. But when the time of promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so they might not live. At this time, Moses was born. And if you look at verse 25, 
Moses, he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand it. So why did Moses go and slay the Egyptian who was persecuting a Hebrew? He understood that God is going to make me a deliverer, and then he sought to to begin that. Now's the time, boom! Now's the time. But his his own brothers didn't see it that way, his own countrymen. Um, He supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you do wrong? Why do you wrong one another? Uh, And then they said, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Who has elevated you? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? And that's to miss the whole point. Then at this, Moses fled and became a dweller. And it was later, if you look at verse 34, God said, I have surely seen the oppression of a people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This is, I'm getting heavy into his thing. He's going to go into a, prof, a prophecy made by Moses of a prophet like Moses. <laughs> and this prophet would be the Redeemer. Uh, we see Joshua, we see David, and we see Solomon in his sermon. And then he says as a culmination, look at how you treated Joshua, look at how you treated Moses, look at how you treated Joseph, look at how you treated... God delivers you and sends these deliverers, and then he says this, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed the, those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. So he is already identifying Jesus as the just one whom God sent and was to be their deliverer. And he has crafted this whole story just using the Bible. And then he suffers. They were cut to the heart, gnashed their teeth, and he says, I see the Son of Man, and then they couldn't stand it anymore. They stopped their ears, ran at him, and then they stoned him. And he said, Lord, as they stoned Stephen, he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And before that, um, or the... After that, he says, Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So that, that's, if you consider the pilgrims at Vanity Fair, it's a very moderate tone now. It's actually the, the, the godly can show their heads and there's a, uh, an acceptance of a kind where those who are of pilgrims are considered honorable in a sense by some. And that's a temporal blessing that God has brought about through particularly the martyrdom of faithful and his blood. And faithful was faithful to the end. What we see with Stephen, he was faithful to the end. He was in the midst of suffering. I don't think he had any false notion that when he was preaching this sermon and he was leading up to, you stiff-necked. And he was just thinking about the glory of God and who Christ is. And with great zeal and great love for Christ and a love for them, he uh, indicts them. He says, you stiff-necked. And we know his heart is not that they merely go to hell or be condemned right there on the spot when he says you... Because he says, Lord, do not charge this sin them with this sin. So his heart is... So there are people, brothers, that are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and they need to hear something appropriate to that tone. But with a heart that's, that wants them to turn to the Lord. That's where that zeal 
and righteous indignation comes from. And faithful would not give in at Vanity Fair. Lord Judge Hate Good could not bend his will, and we need to be that way. We need to consider what it means to suffer in our context. Because even though we might not shed our blood today, suffering in social ways, suffering in familial ways, suffering in the various ways that suffering is endured by God's people throughout all time and is in our context, may be the very instrument that God uses to bless others around you. How was there a blessing coming from Stephen's persecution and suffering? What does it say in the next chapter? Now Saul was consenting to his death. Now I know Saul had a vision and uh, the Lord said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But Paul writes in 1 Timothy, if you go to 1 Timothy, verse 12, chapter 1, verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because He counted me faithful, putting me into ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I can't imagine how many times Paul must have thought of his attitude towards the people of God culminating there at his hatred toward God manifested in his hatred toward Stephen. He's sitting there consenting. People are throwing down their cloaks, getting ready to stone a man whom he and his conscience can't find a way to accuse, but wants to accuse because he is self-righteous and uh, hateful, suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. He doesn't want to submit to the righteousness which is in Christ. He wants his own righteousness. And for someone to indict him as a persecutor and as uh, a man like his fathers were, he's like, get rid of this man. And that's an indication of his heart towards God. And he says here, this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. It was through that, uh, through his conversion, but peculiarly uh, through that time there with Stephen, he says, um, I did it ignorantly in unbelief, but what he said is, I formerly was a, uh, a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man. And although he was that for a long time, all before he was converted, where it culminates is right there in wanting one of Christ's children to be murdered. He's no different than the ones that were throwing the stones. Um, but Christ brought out of that through the blood of Stephen and using this vision, why do you kick against the goads? Um, brought forth Paul who wrote much of the New Testament. Have, have y'all ever heard of um, Fox's Book of Martyrs? Anybody not heard of that? Everybody's heard of it. Um, if you don't own a copy, it's, it's a lot like Pilgrim's Progress in its uh, notoriety and benefit because it's exemplifying these truths through reality, not an allegory. Literally, people that suffered as men. You know, we say suffer as a, when we say suffer as a man, what we mean is like women... Suffer boldly for Christ. Suffer with that holy, humble zeal, but be ready to suffer and do it not with pride, but boldness. And um, what we see there is in the Fox's Book of Martyrs, people who have suffered. And even though you uh, weren't there to see the effects of that suffering, what you will see from reading it yourself is your own heart. Um, 
greatly encouraged if it's done by faith in thinking of God's grace to his people and the glory of his truth being upheld in the midst of opposition at death. So we saw Joseph, we saw Stephen. Let's go to Romans 8 and we'll end there. Which Pastor Mark's getting to. Suffer now, glory later. Y'all remember that sermon from Pastor Rick? Um, This text deals with glory later. Um, We have just went through 9 and 11. So I'm going to read from 12. Um, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, but if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. So, conditional clause, if indeed we suffer with Him, and then a purpose. What that word, that, is a purpose. So what is the purpose of suffering? Like, why would we suffer from this text? What would be our intent behind suffering for the faith? in faithfulness. Brother Tom. So that we may also be glorified with him. Amen. So think about that relationship biblically. Um, I'm getting a little off of temporal benefits to suffering. Uh, We looked at God blessing the people of the land around Egypt, namely Jacob and his household. But uh, we also look at, <clears throat> looked at Stephen and God using that to convict others of sin like Paul and then through the gospel, saving Paul. Um, and then we see the benefits in this life of God saving one Christian on the death of another Christian through Scripture and His apostleship. But now we're looking at talking about the glory to come. Uh, and in this text, what there is a truth here, uh, an in- indicative. If we suffer, we should suffer. And if we do, it's for the purpose that we may be glorified. So, when you are facing persecution, opposition, uh, in the workplace, on the street, in the home, for righteousness, for biblical humility, for trusting the Lord and thinking biblically and responding biblically, when you receive opposition, persecution, that's a form of suffering. And when you suffer, here's what you ought to think. I'm going to suffer in order that I might be glorified. In other words, my eye is set on the glory to come. Not now. Because if you, if you don't think that way, and you think, how can I be glorified now? How, what kind of sufferer will you be for righteousness? Nick? Like an arrogant one, because you're just looking forward to how... An how arrogant, Yeah. yeah. You're going to be a coward. You're going to be uh, unfaithful. Because to avoid the suffering, to just have temporal gain, because people will, will, Vanity Fair will give you all kinds of things to get you to stop walking the king's highway. That's the whole point. Stop them. So, if you want benefits all now, uh, 
and that's where your mind is at, you're not thinking biblically. Our, the biblical mindset is, I'm a pilgrim here, right? I'm not a stranger and a pilgrim to the pilgrimage. I'm a pilgrim to this world and its wicked system in opposition to God. And I'm waiting for the day when Christ will return. I'm waiting for the day when this handbreadth of a life is over and I'm with Him. And that's where my treasure is. Um, because even those who profess to be Christians will persecute you. Uh, but in the text it says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. So like if you have a, a scale, I don't know how to draw a scale. Something like that. If this is suffering, when he puts that on the scale and the glory to come, it doesn't matter what you put here. It doesn't even compare to the weight of the glory to come. He says, I consider the sufferings of this present time, and if you think about Corinthians and the things Paul said he suffered, he says they're not even worthy to be compared. Like, he, he, does, he, he would come out here and say, you don't even make that comparison. You have no idea what is in store for those who trust the Lord and remain faithful to the end. You have no idea. This little life and even death, and it's not bad, brothers, to think about what it might be like to die for Christ. What, what it might be like if someday somebody wants to persecute me in such a way as to take my life and say, if you keep following, they won't ever say it that way. And It's rare. People do. But in some convoluted way to accuse you of doing evil when you're doing righteousness, they're going to say, now we're going to murder you unless you, you deny. Or, and they won't say murder either. We're going to justly hold you accountable for what sins you have done or crimes you have committed. Now we're going to, you know. If it's not wrong for you to think about that, what will it be like for me to be faithful? You know, and like Martin Luther, he said, I can't deviate from what the Bible says. My conscience is bound to the Bible. If you can say, get the Word of God to say something different, then I will believe it. But this is the Word of God. It's an errant and infallible. And it, he does not change. It will not change. So it doesn't matter. And you're going to be held accountable for what you're doing. Because all you can do is uh, just take my life. You can't do anything to my soul. And then Paul just says, it's not even worthy, brothers, to be compared you have no idea the one who suffered on the cross and that God has elevated who you're co-heirs with, what do you think he's going to do when you bear the marks of suffering? Of course, it's hit by his grace. So I'm not saying do this by merit or in your own strength, but by faith. And then he goes on to talk about uh, this, I'm going to leave it here, this earnest expectation and um, groaning. So creation groans, we groan, and the Spirit groans. Um, for the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So if, if we see creation, we see by the Spirit at work in our own hearts, we groaning for that which to come, and we see the Spirit being told that the Spirit groans who intercedes for us Himself, what God is re uh, revealing through a long section here is that we know God works all things for, to good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Be faithful, brothers. So let's leave it there. I'll pray now. Uh, Lord God, we praise You and thank You for sending your Son, uh, the only begotten uh, from glory. And we praise you, Christ Jesus, for the great and awesome mystery of the Incarnation coming in the likeness of men 
and in the likeness of sinful flesh, living a holy life as our substitute. We praise you for your work on our behalf and uh, see you not only as our example of suffering and glory to come, uh, but we trust you. We put our hope in you and we know our strength comes from you for you intercede for us and have redeemed us and purchased us to yourself. Therefore, Father, uh, grant us grace to suffer with the remainder of our lives for your glory. Amen.